Welcome everybody to the post-grad course on uh, overactive bladder third line therapies. We just want to do a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, we will be doing some audience response system questions just to keep everybody engaged and awake um, at the end of the meeting here. Um, so uh, we've got some great technical support kind of wandering around to help us out. But if you could go to your app, do you all have the app for the AUA downloaded? If you could go ahead and tap on that. I was getting my own sort of tech support over there, but then sign into the, if you, when you open the app and you go to what's happening now, you can scroll down and find this course, and then tap on that. And then at the bottom, you'll see a polling icon that says polling on it. And we've just sort of embedded some questions along the way during the course so that we can kind of assess what we know prior to the course and then discuss some of the, the reasons why some of the questions, some of the answers are correct or incorrect. So while you're doing that, I'm just going to read some general in, um, instructions. The AUA policy states that all planners, authors, and presenters must disclose prior to their presentation all relevant financial relationships with any commercial interests. These disclosures are posted on the AUA's annual meeting website. For easy access, please visit aua2019.org. Uh, technically, no photos, video, or audio recordings are permitted. And at the end, we would very much appreciate if you would evaluate the course, give us some feedback, good and bad. We'll take it just so that we can improve as much as possible. Um, and for every course evaluation that you complete, your name will be entered into a drawing for complimentary registration for the AUA 2020 meeting in Washington, D.C. Winners will be announced in June, and you can evaluate this session one of three ways. You could do it through the mobile app that you're clicking on right now, by visiting the planner through our website at aua2019.org, or by visiting the evaluation station in the lobby, which is right outside here as you walk by uh, just before the escalators. And then as part of an ongoing educational outcomes research uh, uh, project, you will receive a post-test and course evaluation survey within 24 to 48 hours to determine knowledge obtained. Everyone who completes this post-test survey will be entered into a random drawing for a $150 Visa gift card. Okay, so with that, we'll get started. Uh, I have a wonderful uh, faculty here with me, Dr. G David Ginsberg, who's professor of urology at University of Southern California in Los Angeles, Dr. Sandip Vasavada, who's at the Cleveland Clinic and runs the pelvic floor FPMRS program there, and it's a real privilege for me to have them both here. They also happen to be officers of SUFU. Um, Vice President Sandeep and uh, Secretary Treasurer David. So um, we've had some good time putting this together for you. These are my disclosures. So there are various types of urinary incontinence, of course. Um, we are really going to be concentrating on urgency incontinence today. Detrusor overactivity or detrusor hypersensitivity. So it could be a motor issue or it could be a sensory issue. The terminology that we use, as you know, overactive bladder is a, a constellation of symptoms, whereas detrusor overactivity is actually a urodynamic uh, observation. So this is detrusor overactivity here, where you have an elevation in the detrusor pressure during the filling phase of urodynamics. Some patients can have overactive bladder without having detrusor overactivity. So that urodynamically, they look just fine. There's no um, increase in the detrusor pressure, and those patients may be better uh, categorized as hypersensitivity. Um, AUA and SUFU guidelines for first and second line therapy include first line therapies, behavioral and dietary modification, and physical therapy. A lot of times our residents forget that physical therapy is there, and then pharmacotherapy is considered second line therapy, so anticholinergics or antimuscarinics and beta-3 agonists. But what happens when meds don't work? And we know from the literature that up to 80% of people are no longer on medications by the time we get to the one-year mark. And that can be for a variety of reasons. It can be lack of efficacy. It can be cost. It can be side effects. And this has been a topic of conversation for a long time. 
So Dr. Vasavada actually just gave the update uh, on the AUA guideline, AUA SUFU guidelines for overactive bladder just a day or two ago on the plenary. Um, third line therapies is what we're really going to be focusing on today. So posterior tibial nerve stimulation, sacral neuromodulation, and on a botulinum toxin A injections of the bladder. And now fourth line therapies rather than other therapies, um, the augmentation cystoplasty and urinary diversion um, reconstructive procedures are considered fourth line therapies. The other addition to the um, uh, overactive bladder guidelines was that you don't have to use this as a stepwise. It's not an algorithm. In other words, there are some patients who may very much benefit going from going to what we call third line therapies, even if they don't, without starting medications, for instance. So first question, we'll have three questions here to start with, and then I'm going to pass the baton on to Dr. Ginsburg. A 52-year-old woman has urgency, incontinence, and frequency in spite of avoiding dietary irritants and bladder training. According to the AUA SUFU OAB guidelines, the next step is pelvic floor physical therapy, add pharmacotherapy, posterior tibial nerve stimulation, on a botulinum toxin A injection of the bladder, and sacral neuromodulation. So if you could please enter that into your app. Yes. Oh I, oh, I have to advance. I'm sorry. That's me. Okay. Sorry. This is... Okay, good. Well, as we just alluded to, uh, for the actual correct response is public for physical therapy according to the guidelines. Now you could argue with me that I just said you don't have to do things in a stepwise fashion, but according to the guidelines, physical therapy is, is a first line therapy, right? But we'll be talking about all of this. Um, something just happened. Okay, a 32-year-old woman with multiple sclerosis and poor manual dexterity has severe urgency incontinence and, urgency and urinary frequency refractory to first and second line therapies. The best next step is, which is probably, the next best step is, A, posterior tibial nerve stimulation, B, oops, oops, that's me, I did that. Sorry, getting used to this. I'm going to click one more time, right? Posterior tibial nerve stimulation on a botulinum toxin A, sacral neuromodulation, augmentation cystoplasty, urinary diversion. David's giving me the eye because he edits the exam, and that's probably not a great question, but it's for discussion. <laughs> Okay, so this is worth discussing. I mean, really, you want to take into account a couple of things. Number one, for patients with MS who may need MRIs in the future, what we'll talk about today is that you can't do um, sacral neuromodulation, or you technically can't because they can't have MRIs with a neuromodulator in place. So we're going to talk about some of these things. Um, posterior tibial nerve stimulation is not unreasonable, maybe not going to be as successful on a botulinum toxin A and augmentation cystoplasty, run the risk of needing in and out catheterization, and she has poor manual dexterity. So it's arguable if the urinary diversion is the next best step, but that is certainly an option to really consider. And lastly, before I pass the baton, the optimal lead placement for successful sacral neuromodulation is is superior and lateral and S2. I should wait. Actually, you know, can I go back or am I too late? Okay, I'm going to give you a second to think about this one. Superior and lateral in S2, inferior and medial in S3, superior and medial in S3, superior and lateral in S4, and inferior and medial in S4. So that was too much to be thinking while the, the timer was ticking. So please go ahead and respond. Okay, good. Um, so this one is not as controversial. It's superior and medial in S3, and we will be talking about techniques on how to best achieve that. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Ginsburg. So I can have the, <clears throat> the intro slides. Ginsburg, 
I think that's it. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, just a couple, I'm gonna do a quick little, another little bit of an intro, kind of just set up where we're going with this. But I also wanna emphasize, we're gonna have cases at the end. There'll be some interaction between there. But if there's a question that someone has in the middle of one of these talks, feel free to raise your hand and, and we're happy to discuss this as we're going. We'd like to have as much interaction discussion as possible. So here are my disclosures. So just a little brief overview, like you know, how prevalent is overactive bladder? Um, you know, we see this as urologists. We see a lot of patients, obviously, with overactive bladder. But, you know, theoretically, up to 11% of the world has overactive bladder, maybe even more. If you look at here um, in North America, it's 44 million. So whatever it is, it's a lot of people and a lot of our patients have overactive bladder. And if you look at other studies, it would say it's as prevalent as one in six adults. It doesn't necessarily mean one in six adults all want therapy. It doesn't necessarily mean one in six adults, if they fail oral therapy, want to go on to third line therapies. But it certainly is very prevalent. And I think what's important to appreciate, it's equally prevalent in women as in men. So KK has already alluded to how we treat this in the tiers of therapy, where the first tier is behavioral, but also if you want to use medications with that, there's medical therapy and then the third line therapies. And really what we mostly do are second tier therapies. So how we treat overactive bladder in the majority of patients, really focusing on second tier therapies. It's either medications you want to give patients four to six weeks. And the question is, does it work? Do they tolerate it? And in some countries, depending upon the cost structure, there's a very significant issue is, can you afford it? For example, at least in America, Mirabagron, beta-3, there's no generic. Can the patient afford this long term? So which drug to use? It's a question that we all answer, have to answer every day when we see our patients. And the question, answer may be, it may not matter. Because at the end of the day, unfortunately, if you look at Studies that look at persistence, which is why we're having this course, patients don't do great. They don't stay on these medications long term. And why is that? It just might not make them better enough to continue with the medication, and that might be combined with too much dry mouth, constipation, maybe some cognitive issues. It may be a cost issue, or likely it's some combination of all of those three or two of those three, whatever it may be. Persistence is just not great with our oral medications. So a lot of patients have it. They don't do great with oral meds, and we know there's a significant impact on quality of life, and that can be a whole lecture unto itself. This is the one slide. It's a, there's a significant quality of life issue, and it bothers patients. So we know a lot of people have it. We know they're treated with meds. They don't necessarily stay on it long term, and they're bothered. So what do we do next? Well, we have our guidelines and we have the third tier therapies we're going to focus on. But a couple quick slides on combination therapy, because this is new. We've had a couple of recent studies that have come out in the literature that speak to combination therapy with a beta-3 and an anticholinergic and showing improvements in a variety of parameters, whether it's incontinence episodes or voids. The trade-off is there's more adverse events. And that's what led to the new addition of the guideline that Santa presented this weekend that you can now consider a combination therapy for patient refractory. Santa, do you want to add anything to, with, with, this, with this addition to the guideline? Yeah, thanks, Dave. I think the only thing is, like, like he says, may consider. So just understand it's not mandated that if you try and fail a monotherapy, be it an anticholinergic or a beta-3, that you have to then try combination before going on to third line. And so, as you can imagine, every time we write these guidelines, there's very few, you know, very extremely strong statements that you have to do something. There's often a may or should consider or may consider, and it's very, uh, very um, specific as to why we do that to give the uh, provider some flexibility. To, to, to Sandip's point, you know, there's nothing really mandated in the guidelines. The, the folks that mandate us, interestingly, often are the payers. You know, where I may have given someone drug X and they have failed and we want to go on to a third line and a payer will now say, well, you have to try this drug X for six weeks or try drug Y for six weeks. We already know the patient couldn't even tolerate the drug after two weeks. Why am I going to go six more weeks on this? This is just challenges we 
can have, at least in the states, depending upon where you live, this may or may not be an issue. Um, but it's certain challenges we can have. So this is the plan for the rest of the morning. Uh, Sanab's going to go first and talk about tibial nerve. I'm going to talk about botulinum. KK, who she didn't mention, you know, Sanip is the vice president of SUFU, and I'm secretary treasurer. She's actually our president now, um, which has been a very uh, significant task these past several weeks as the FDA has made new statements regarding the use of mesh and prolapse, and a lot of that has fallen in her lap um, in terms of our response from SUFU. That's a whole, and that's a whole other course and lecture. So, and then we'll finish up with pace and scenarios, and again, there's questions, Please yell them out, and, uh, and with that, we'll turn it over to Dr. Vasavada. Thank you. And I should mention that she handled that very well, because you can imagine it's a, it's a contentious area with the mesh and mesh litigation. You've heard some talk about that here, even at this meeting. And, and again, for our society to be one of the lead societies in the world, to have to comment on that, again, was, uh, was extremely well handled by, by Kathleen. So uh, as David mentioned, I'm going to speak on uh, percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation. And uh, my relevant disclosures are as, are as listed. So in addition to the actual PTNS, we'll start to go into a couple of the one-offs in that same general region with the tibial nerve, because this is probably the next steps in evolution that I'd at least like to give you um, as options. As he mentioned, we'll use the audience response system. I think we'll bake those questions in towards the end. So as mentioned already, and, and again, we, we covered a bit earlier, this is the original guideline in 2015, the second guideline, I should say, update, where we also considered, again, standard things, behavioral modification, patient education, pharmacotherapy, when that fails, move on to the third line. And the only thing I'd like to highlight when we talk about second line therapy or medications is that we also put brackets around the time frame or duration that people should adequately give these medications. In other words, we said arbitrarily four to eight weeks, but if that doesn't work, maybe try another one, but then at some point you need to consider moving that patient on. And again, that's what the subject of the rest of our, our morning is about. And so we'll talk specifically about tibial nerve stimulation. This is the latest uh, algorithm that we have that will uh, also be updated on for those of you who use the apps or uh, you know, print materials, et cetera, for uh, the AUA SUFU guideline. And so specifically, again, the same things. And again, I call out, and you can't see it very well, but on the bottom left is what uh, uh, Kathleen mentioned earlier about not necessarily needing to follow in an extremely hierarchical order, step one, two, three, four, et cetera. And specific to tibial nerve stimulation, um, there's been concerns with anticholinergics and dementia and, and cognitive issues that have been certainly uh, talked about around the world in literature and, and maybe allows a extremely uh, low adverse event profile therapy like PTNS to be used, considered in perhaps an at-risk patient earlier. So, so again, that's where I think if you want to read between the lines a little on that, uh, we did that. We did not specifically move that to second line, but it allows one to consider flexibility-wise to use that at different times. So it's a really a peripheral neuromodulation technique that we're going to talk about. It's based on other therapies, including the Stolar uh, afferent nerve stimulation device, and really has a lot of analogies to you know Chinese acupuncture. And, and a friend of mine actually does acupuncture, and I asked him, I said, if a patient came to you and said, I have some bladder issues, is there anything specific you'd do? And, and very unsolicited, unprompted, said, you know, I, I would put it in this region, which incidentally ended up being right near the posterior tibial nerve. So there's a lot to it in, in terms of that. So it was first introduced, and for those of you who know, you know, Ed McGuire actually had a lot to do with this. Everyone thinks, uh, you know, his, his big, biggest advent was on the slings and some of the the uh, detrusor leak point pressure testing, but also including this. Uh, and so he was able to show that electrical stimulation at that level was able to help detrusor overactivity, ultimately getting approval in the United States here in 2000. And then we expanded its use uh, considerably uh, with more commercializations. So as Kathleen mentioned, you know, the S3 nerve foramen and S3 nerve is the motor nerve target for sacral nerve stimulation, but the peripheral, uh, periphery, and specifically in this case, the tibial nerve, really gets projections from multiple levels. So in this case, it's really the you know, S2, L4, S1, L5, S1, 2, and 3. So it's multiple nerves that sort of project in and coalesce to create those fashions in the uh, posterior tibial nerve. Again, this is what we know for sacral nerve for, uh, stimulation, that we always try to aim for that S3 nerve with the standard responses. We'll get some of that with the posterior tibial nerve stimulation, but not necessarily all of it, because again, you've got a mixed nerve branch here going. 
It, it's interesting because it relies on something called uh, carryover effect. In other words, therapy might be done on a Monday. Well, that patient wants her bladder behaving well on Friday when she's out with her friends. So how does it work? Well, the peripheral nerve uh, system, peripheral nervous system, really does allow more of this intermittent-based stimulation to work. So again, she gets her therapy on Monday, but her bladder's still behaving on Friday. So how does that work? Well, it's going to need some priming and juicing, so it has to be done periodically and, and frequently, but at some point, it doesn't need to be continuous. And we still believe at present time, although that's being questioned, on sacral nerve stimulation being the same, a different way, where it has to be continuous, but it's also being investigated that can you do it just intermittently, in other words, not all the time. So it's a, something unique somewhat with the, uh, with the um, peripheral nervous system. Mechanism of action, again, not totally completely understood, but we think we know, because it's got these nerve uh, projections from other spinal roots, and that retrograde, uh, perhaps even up to the central nervous system and back down, eliciting effect. And again, we won't go too much into the theory of that because it's really not that important because it's been approved for many years and we all use it. So how is it ultimately done from a very practical standpoint? The treatment leg is elevated. We use a very small needle. In fact, sometimes the reps who make these companies will show on themselves how to place the needles, which is you know kind of a little scary, but they do. Uh, but it doesn't hurt because it's a small 34-gauge needle. It should be near, but not necessarily on the nerve, so you don't have to create or elicit pain. The grounding electrode is placed over the medial aspect of the calcaneus, and then it's connected to this stimulator and then at a fixed frequency and so forth. There are some specific contraindications that you should be aware of, and it's not often talked about because not that many of our patients have these, but when they do, we need to ask ourselves that question, should I, should I not use this? And so cardiac pacemakers, defibrillators, Pregnancy or those seeking pregnancy, technically contraindicated, and those with some significant enough nerve damage. I don't know if that's a hard contraindication on the nerve damage side, but it probably bodes well that you don't use the nerve because you may not elicit a significant benefit if there's a reason for that. And I, all I can think of are patients with uh, peripheral neuropathies and things like that that you may not see the significant benefit you might see in a, in a similar uh, matched patient who does not have that. So technique, again, is as follows. Small 34-gauge needle going in here, grounding pad here, connected to the device, and then to do the stimulation. And we'll talk about the various protocols. Um, again, I think hopefully you have all this in your syllabus material. I didn't want to put this in at this because it takes a lot of bandwidth. But uh, there's, there's a variety of videos out there for those who are interested in, in looking at that. And, and you can really just do a quick search. But uh, this is one that we put together, uh, very simple. Uh, practical video on tibial nerve stimulation. So let's look at a little bit of the literature because this is the sort of basis that we all use. And, and I'll talk just briefly on one of the sham trials because there was concern, is this really even actively doing anything? I think we have the answers now to that. And then we'll look at some of the other uh, trial data that's kind of gotten us to the point that we're at today. So the sham trials were neat because we really, again, questioned, okay, I'm putting this really 34-gauge needle and having this patient come in once a week, typically for 12 weeks of stimulation, and then once a month thereafter. So that's been the standard protocol that most people have adhered to. And saying, is that really going to do something, or is it just this placebo phenomenon? And so Ken Peters did a really, a really nice job with developing a sham model and then you know, assessing overall OAB symptoms in response to that and used a, a global response assessment tool for that and had the standard inclusion criteria with that. And so really what he did is randomize patients to something called a Streitberger needle placement and then comparing that to the uh, active electrodes, et cetera, and seeing if we can tell if a patient could tell if they were on active versus not or not. And so what they found is that those patients, you know, did well on the tibial nerve active stimulation arm, did not get any benefit significantly on the sham arm, and then also were not able to accurately describe which treatment arm they were on. So that it was a valid model that they used and created. And so again, shown here with terms of improvement and global response assessments, patients in the active tibial nerve arm did better than the ones on the sham arm. So I think it seems like you know, that really made a lot of difference for us. You know, I've looked at this and other data and kind of put together a handful of sort of, I won't call them criticisms, but it's definitely things that we worry about with these sham trials. There's an unknown comorbidity status. Are they excluding certain types of patients? Combination of men and women, we kind of look at those patients a little bit differently because we know the prostate introduces its own level uh, you know, of challenges in, in some of the OAB dry patients typically. Are we looking at OAB wet and dry patients? 
different tibial nerve stimulation regimens. In the United States, most of us use the once a week fa fashion, but some places use it more often if you can do that. And then primary outcome measures, right? These are the moving targets that everyone uh, seems to create in the literature. So there's never been a hard and fast measure. Is it a reduction in urge incontinence, which uh, you know Kathleen will speak on, especially with uh, sacral neuromodulation that we've all held to because that was the FDA standard in the United States, or uh, other response ass assessments, including global response questionnaires, et cetera. At the end of the day, we want our patient happy, so I don't know if it really makes that much difference, but when it comes to data, we like to lean on something more. So some of the comparative data as well. Ken had done another study looking at this, and this is PTNS versus anticholinergics, and this is comparing it to tolteridine or detrol four milligrams a day. And then when they did that, they also showed you know, again, improvements in both groups and really not a whole lot of difference, maybe a slight tend to, to, to uh, improvement in the tibial nerve over the tolteridine, but not anything dramatically different. So it was really fairly comparable to that of pharmacotherapy. Other trials have also done the same thing and looking at various uh, fashions of tibial nerve versus other medications. And again, found similar uh, benefits in terms of tibial nerve versus anticholinergics, but maybe slight differences in terms of the improvements. So slight improvements over anticholinergics. Again, I'll show you this data real quickly. Again, looking at the data, looking at some of the criticisms, very little power calculation, no details on randomization, nothing on the inclusion exclusion criteria. And so it's just a little bit less clear when you look at that data. And that's the unfortunate nature of most of what we have. Some people have said, well, can we do better than just tibial nerve stimulation? So this is using tibial nerve stimulation with an anticholinergic because our patients all want to push the envelope a little, right? If you can do anything better than what they're at, they're always going to try to do that. And so this is taking a couple studies, really, that looked at that. And patients were starting PTNS and then randomized in certain fashions to adding uh, medications alone or not. And what they did find is that patients did better. So combination patients did better. So tibial nerve st stimulation and anticholinergics, I'm not aware of any studies with tibial nerve stimulation and a beta-3, did work better. But we start to introduce the side effects of the anticholinergics. So now I'm taking a therapy with tibial nerve stimulation that really doesn't have major downside effects, and I'm introducing that again with the anticholinergic and the dry mouth and the constipation and, as I mentioned, with the at-risk patient population and the elderly that I might use for this type of a therapy. Now I'm adding that anticholinergic burden and polypharmacy and things that we all talk about and worry about. So let's look at its use in refractory overactive bladder. So again, the reason why we're all here in this refractory OAB state. So there's really a couple few trials, you know, older trials that have looked at that, and it works a little bit better. But again, the punchline is... There's data there, but it's not so strong. So you might even ask, you know, why, why do we put that on third-line therapy? You know, some people would really argue that it's really more analogous to second-line therapy because everything I showed you so far, it's very similar in outcome data as an anticholinergic, maybe a little bit better, and, and that's what this refractory data shows, but not so much as to, uh, to the other therapies that both David and Kathleen will speak about. And there's probably a big question mark there, but we were worried also that if you do too much in the first line and second line realms, that there was sort of an abuse potential. So abuse potential means people will just start to use that, especially from a monetary gain and so forth. So we really were a little hesitant to do that too far up to first line and second line therapy when we did the original guidelines. And it was, it was really a significant area of, of contention, and that was based on data abstracted up to 2011. So we had that and, and questioned that. But now I think that area is, is maybe a little bit more firm, <clears throat> that we can allow flexibility to the care providers to use it at different levels. Duration of therapy, again, this has been looked at. You know, can you do it short? Can you do it long? Do you have to do it 12 weeks? And it seems to be about 12 weeks. We oftentimes will have patients that we will tell them, you will not receive significant benefit till about six weeks and then continue additively. So it's sometimes a challenge for, for our team to say, listen, you got to stick with it. you got to stick with this therapy because it's going to take a little longer before that improves. So if a patient's not receiving benefit early, we're going to still wait, continue, continue before we really say that this therapy is not beneficial. So again, typically we'll go about 12 weeks in that. And again, various uh, data points that have been looked at looking at symptom relief in both groups, but it seems to need a little bit longer to get to that maximal effect. And then once a month thereafter is this typical protocol that people have used to allow the maintenance of the therapy. So 12 weeks, once a week, and then three, every uh, month thereafter uh, at this point in time in perpetuity. 
Durability, again, same thing, seems to work. And then for the studies where they had extension arms, they did see that those patients, for the most part, did continue to use the therapy and did pretty well. So again, most of the data had really been carried out to about three years on the follow-up, and the majority of patients continue to do so. So again, it takes some special uh, commitment, if you will, on both the care provider's standpoint as well as the patient to continue to come in and, and get therapy. Cost analysis wise, again, just real quickly on this, uh, it, it, it can add cost. And so when you look at a generic anticholinergic, you know, that's the cheapest thing we've got. And for some of the products, it's very, very inexpensive. So comparing that, you know, yeah, we're going to add cost to the whole system with that. But I think the side effect profile and other aspects to it may be a benefit uh, over and above that. So this is where the adverse events come by. We, we've looked at this and published, it's really, it's really hard to kill a patient, I think, with tibial nerve stimulation. I'll say that. But furthermore, even eliciting any problems with that therapy, it's very unlikely to do that. Um, and then again, comparing that to anticholinergics, several trials have shown this and really shown that the anticholinergics most certainly, and, and this follows to reason, have a much higher side effect profile than anything will elicit with the tibial nerve stimulation. I'm just going to show you a couple things in terms of the limitations as we dovetail in the last few minutes here on the other therapy options looking, being looked at. <clears throat> it does require a commitment. Frequent office visits, compliance is no question. You know, how are those patients going to continue to do that? And can we remove, move any portion of this to a home-based therapy? Because it's really not you know, that significant in terms of the impact where you come into the office, but it's a pain. It's a pain to have to continue to do, and, and it's a commitment from the office. And so that's where people have started using some transcutaneous tibial nerve therapy. So this is probably implying someone doesn't have a big edematous leg or, or have a, other challenges to their lower extremity, but now you can try a transcutaneous tibial nerve therapy, and that's been published in the literature. And so this is actually taking almost like a TENS unit, for those of you who are familiar with its use in, in back and other pain disorders. Um, home use is great. Compliance has improved. Overall, well tolerated. Maybe you can start to even do this more often. And that's where the therapy uh, has been done and pushed in other parts of the country more so than in the United States. And so this is one of the studies that has been done comparing it with uh, tibial nerve stimulation. And again, looking at that, you know, it worked. And you can put these little patch electrodes then in this area of the distribution of the tibial nerve. And so when I do this in the, therapy, in the clinics, I tell them you need to feel a little bit of a, a, a toe kind of flexion or feeling in your big toe on that same side. The nice thing it allows us to do is to do this therapy more often. It gives them the opportunity to do it in the comfort of their own home. They can watch the ball game. They put these patch electrodes on. They can do it for 30, 45, 60 minutes. And there's probably at some point where there's not a whole lot of benefit. I mean, if you keep it on for four hours, I don't think that's really necessary a day. But maybe doing it three times a week or four times a week, that maybe we'll get even a better response rate in that. Similarly, tibial nerve targets have been targeted as far as an implant-based technology. Again, follows to reason. Patients don't want to come into the office every week. I have patients who live literally across the street from the facility. They're like, oh, I can't come in every week for a therapy like that. So it just really limits their abilities to continue the therapy because they just won't come in in a compliant fashion weekly. So as I mentioned, you know, the tibial nerve stimulation once a week for 12 weeks, that's frequent visits. And we mentioned and, and really pushed that in the OAB guidelines. You have to have a commitment from the patient. But can we predict or achieve a therapy that allows better patient compliance and maybe even get a better uh, implant a, a technology based that might be allowing the patient to do this therapy more frequently. So um, there's a variety of therapies evolving uh, on implant-based technologies. Um, and so there's, there's other ones that require an electrode implant, other ones that require something like this that I think was presented yesterday, a coin-based uh, therapy, which basically delivers intermittent stimulation to the area of the tibial nerve stimulation. And there's the data was presented even with 12-month follow-up now that was pretty good just, uh, just yesterday, I believe. Um, and so there's different ways to do it. There's another implantable system that once the implant goes in, they have to wear this little... Uh, um, device around their ankle that stimulates or kind of boosts the uh, electrical charge to it. So this won't have an actual electrical charge, but the outside portion does. So you have to be pretty close to the nerves. You have to place this in a very specific location. But the patients don't really feel a lot. As I mentioned, the, even our reps sometimes will show us on themselves how to place the nerve um, uh, implant. But in terms of the actual pain in that area, it's very, oddly enough, very insensate. So it's nice and well tolerated for that. And then another, again, therapy that's being done, again, all fairly similar uh, in terms of what they're trying to do. 
and implant-based technology. So these are, none of them are FDA approved yet, but as you can see, and hopefully in the next year or two years at these meetings, we'll be able to bring out some of the data that'll be there. There'll be more data coming out, I, I'm assuming, maybe between uh, sacral neuromodulation. We're gonna look at other com uh, comparative data as well and, and trying to get some more standardization in patients uh, with overactive bladder and urgent incontinence. So there's still a lot more to be done, but we're, we're getting there. But I still think it has a role in this, uh, in this day and age and beyond. Um, the afferent nerve activity does suggest a different mechanism of action. It seems to work and works centrally too. Uh, the weekly application portion is a real a chore, so it does require a commitment on both caregiver and patient standpoints, but it has to be done in, in based on what we can tell technology-wise. And then other protocols are still being looked at, but you got to really look at the data carefully, what their entry criteria was, et cetera, before you look at that proactively. And then the implantable uh, nerve targets are certainly going to go in that uh, direction. I think it's going to continue to only benefit because the uh, preliminary data seems to show that it works pretty well. Okay, and then I think uh, we have a couple audience response questions. So is that coming up? No. Oop, sorry. Okay, so the first question. 61-year-old woman with overactive bladder is undergoing posterior tibial nerve stimulation weekly. She's only on her fourth week of therapy and feels minimal clinical benefits so, her, so far. Her urinalysis is negative and her post void residual is 65 ml. The next step is A, continue PTNS weekly, B, increase amplitude of stimulation, C, change PTNS to contralateral tibial nerve, D, change to sacral neuromodulation, or E, add onabotulinum toxin A injections. So I'll ask you all to use your app and put the answer in. Lowercase too. <laughs> Very nice. Everyone listened to me. That's good. I mean, no one, no, my kids never listen to me, but at least you guys do, so I appreciate that. Um, so continue with PTNS. So it's going to take more time. So you, you got to really be a little bit of a cheerleader for these patients to encourage them to continue the therapy. All right. 66-year-old woman would like to initiate tibial nerve stimulation for refractory urgent continence and severe constipation. She has a cardiac pacemaker for arrhythmia. The next step is A, anticholinergics, B, remove pacemaker and start PTNS, D, uh, C, PTNS is contraindicated with a case, uh, pacemaker, plan another therapy, D, change pacing rhythm when having weekly PTNS, or E, decrease PTNS amplitude. So please put your answers in on that. Okay, yeah, exactly. So PTNS is contraindicated with a cardiac pacemaker. You have to look into another therapy, and I think that's what I will leave uh, Kathleen and David to speak about the other therapies. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sandip. Um, I'm going to do a quick poll of everybody here. I'm going to go to the botulinum toxin. Um, how many of you all here already do PTNS in your office? How many do SNS regularly? And how many do Botox? Do I have you? Okay, fantastic. Um, I have a question, David. Yes. How often do you see your patients that you're doing PTNS? I mean, do you have your, how many have their nurses do all 12 and then you see them at the end? How many see them somewhere in between there? And how many see them every week and do it yourself? So we see them at their first visit and then six to kind of encourage them for the reasons that Sandip mentioned that if they get discouraged, there is data. And I and I kind of give a little disclaimer to my patients because it sounds like I'm trying to sell them something when I say, I know it doesn't it hasn't worked yet at six weeks, but hang in there until ten or twelve and it, you know, there's data that shows that it'll work if you go all the way through. And it sounds kind of awkward. Do you have any tips on how you tell your patients without sounding like you're trying to so I'm, uh, yeah, no, I agree. I think it's a know, challenge. You're a cheerleader in this oil. situation. <laughs> um, but it's like anything else we do in therapy-wise, and, and, and both of them will speak to expectations, an appropriate expectation setting. And, and I don't know if we'll get too many patients totally dry and perfect, especially if they're more severe, moderate to severe with this therapy. And, and furthermore, yeah, it's going to take some time. And, and it's a challenge. I'll, I'll totally agree with that. It, it is a challenge. 
Santa, one, one other question. So you're on the OAB guideline, and 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 we've Sufu being one of the sponsors of the guideline, we vote on the new changes, and there was definitely a lot of discussion about moving PTNS to a second line therapy in line with oral medications. You alluded to that. It is not at that level. Are you doing this at all in your practice in certain patients? Yeah, so I think in, in an elderly or at-risk patient who we are challenged, and we're all faced with the same challenges, and, and David mentioned it, that you know maybe a, a beta-3 is too expensive, maybe they have a hypertensive issue and they're on more than one drug and it's a challenge in, in terms of their blood pressure, and then they're at risk based on cognitive issues or dementia for an anticholinergic use or polypharmacy. So in a patient like that, I think it's very justified to consider that in, in a second line realm. I think we would all probably say the same. Great. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the, the most likely scenario. We actually have a paper that we've just submitted that probably was just just not in time for, for your um, for your update on the guidelines, but looking at patients who are medication naive, and they actually did quite well on PTNS. So I think in the next iteration, I would venture to guess that it might move up a little bit, but um, how many of you have, um, not maybe not stopped, but really, uh, how many of you really think about an anti muscarinic you know, before you give an anti muscarinic to your patients now? I mean, I really, I really, I'm a lot more cautious about it, and, and yeah. certainly in my elderly patients. And so, to have more options. Yeah, the uh, problem is, is cost for people. Well, cost for right. Mirabegron, which is okay, but right. you know the, the the scariness of the cognitive side effects. No, the thing is that if they have cognitive side effects, whether it's related to your anti-muscarinic or not, no one's ever going to know. If they have changes, they might say it's that medicine that you gave mm -hmm. me, right? So, it's important for for us to acknowledge that, right. I think, with our patients. Well, we were often stuck between a rock and a hard place and that to try any of these third tiers, even PTNS, you have to fail an oral therapy. The patient absolutely sometimes can't then afford the beta-3. So you're going down and giving them an anti-muscarinic and they already have a little bit of cognitive decline. Like, you're really in, in a stuck between a rock and a hard place to get past to that, to go down to a third tier after that. But it's kind of the game we all have, games we all have to play. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk about botulinum toxin, and this is what we're going to go through today. I have two ARS questions within the, the, the system, and I would feel free to vote. I think there are a grand total of 10 votes. I think there are more than 10 people here. Um, so feel free to vote. So what is botulinum toxin and how does it work? So it's... It's a neurologic toxin. Um, it's been around for a very long time. It's been around since the 60s. It started in the ophthalmologic world. It was uh, FDA approved. The first FDA actual approval indication was for strabismus, but it's used in a variety of systems. Um, I, I'm married to a dermatologist. My wife uses always used a lot of botulinum toxin. It's interesting how much we've stolen from dermatology because we use their fillers as bulking agents as well. Um, so I was on board with botulinum toxin early because she'd been using it and I knew it was safe. Um, so there are three different types of type A boch, uh, botulinum toxin. We're going to focus on on a botulinum toxin because that is what has FDA approval. Um, there are There is some data on both ABO and ankle botulinum, but for time's sake, I'm just going to really focus on on a botulinum toxin A. Um, there's also, t and you can't, the strengths are different. So again, you're looking at numbers. These are just for on a botulinum toxin A. There's a little bit on type B. Um, it tends to be much shorter acting. Um, it's been used more for patients that maybe have failed type A, but really it's not going to be a great option either. So. Uh, here is the question, which is botulinum toxin A improves bladder function by blocking muscarinic receptor sites, increasing sympathetic activity of the bladder, increasing SNAP25 activity, inhibiting neuromuscular release, and upregulating upreg up calcium channel mediated bladder relaxation. And the majority of you got this right, which is in inhibiting neurotransmitter release of the neuromuscular junction. So it's a three-step process how this works. And there's a heavy and a light chain of the botulinum toxin. So when you, when you, if you, if you've used it, you've seen it. It doesn't look like there's anything there. You know, the the other powder that we used to use before use botulinum toxin would be something like 
prostaglandin for erectile dysfunction, you saw the powder in the vial. And you got that first powder, powder of Botox, I'm like, there's nothing here. Where, 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 is, where is the substance? It's crystallized there, so don't freak out if you've not done it before. That, that's appropriate. When you do mix it, you absolutely don't want to shake it vigorously because you don't want to disrupt the light in the heavy chain. So the toxin binds to the nerve ending at the level of the heavy chain, and then it gets translocated, and then you get into the cytosol, and that's where it cleaves these docking programs. So it's cleaves SNAP25, and by cleaving SNAP25, these, these um, vesicles that have neurotransmitters now cannot fuse at the nerve ending and deliver those neurotransmitters at the neuromuscular junction. Now, I'm saying neurotransmitters. We talk about acetylcholine. We know that when acetylcholine comes out at the neuromuscular junction, binds to the muscle, bladder contraction occurs, it's, it's actually much more involved than just acetylcholine. I have and others. There are other neurotransmitters that are involved. That absolutely, it's much more than just blocking that acetylcholine. But this is how botulinum toxin works. So what are the outcomes? So the first time this was ever used in the lower urinary tract was in an injection in the, to the external sphincter for spinal cord injury patients with external sphincter dyssynergia. And it works okay, it tends to be short-lived, and that really didn't catch on. But it's really where it caught in initially was for neurogenic detrusor overactivity. So we're gonna talk about some of the neurogenic detrusor overactivity data first. So the first study that was done was really looking at what's the right dose? Because we started at 300 units. That was just arbitrarily, Brigitte Schurk's group in Switzerland started at 300 units. And is that the right dose? So we looked at placebo control trial, placebo 200 and 300 units, and found that both, both dosages were superior to placebo. Um, they both worked well and had decreased urgent con urinary incontinence episodes, maybe a little bit of a longer duration of effect with 300 units, but there was greater risk of retention for those that weren't already catheterizing at baseline and other adverse events, and it turns out that 200 units appeared to be the optimal dose and what was approved by the FDA. So if you look at the study that two landmark studies that got the, the phase three trials that got this drug approved for neurogenic detrusor overactivity, it's a little bit different than the standard overactive bladder study you see. If you look at overactive bladder meds, it's almost exclusively women. This was about 50-50. They're usually around 65 to 70 years old. This is a younger age group. And these are patients that had either multiple sclerosis or spinal cord injury. And they were wet. If you look at their average episodes of incontinence, they're averaging about four and a half episodes of incontinence per day. This is a very wet group that has already failed medications. So if you look at the, the, the improvement in number of episodes of urinary incontinence, there's a couple things to see. I mean, one is placebo actually does pretty good here, and we're going to talk about that. But certainly the medication does better. And it lasts on average 10 months, which is very interesting because if you go to my wife to get Botox for these lines that I have that she wants me to get Botox for, but I must say I'm okay, um, mm -hmm. I'm going to be coming back to her every two to three months. But in the bladder, it lasts much longer. We're not entirely sure why. You know, you say this is striated muscle versus smooth muscle, but I, people have told me that's much more than just that. When you look at how many patients are dry, you know, about a third are dry. But again, I talked to the placebo effect on the diaries. That was urinary incontinence frequency diaries. But in neurogenic bladder, as opposed to OAB, we're going to talk about that, what really is going to be important are the urodynamic results. We don't care about urodynamic results with overactive bladder. But when you look at the urodynamic results, this to me is just fantastic. There is no placebo effect at all on the urodynamic outcomes. And when you look at this, you see that patients are having an increase in their maximum systematic capacity of 135 at 150 cc's. If I give someone an antimuscarinic, anybody have an idea how much volume we in they increase their bladder capacity on their bladder diary? In the best study and the highest dose is about 40 cc's. Nothing bigger than that, right? About 40 cc's. 
with, with now these are patients have failed oral meds and we're increasing their bladder capacity by 150. And you're also very nicely decreasing their bladder pressures. Adverse events, most common adverse events are infection and UTI. We'll talk about that in a little bit. What's the catheterization rate? This study, we didn't do a good job of really having parameters of when do you start catheterization. It was based on each individual study site. So placebo was 6%. Like, why would you need to catheterize if you're on placebo? Some of these patients were MS patients that were not catheterizing at baseline and maybe should have been, and then they started to. So I tell patients it's about 25%, the difference between 200 units and placebo, the risk of catheterization. Um, that being said, if I see an MS patient, it's a neurogenic patient, that's not catheterizing at baseline, I'm probably going to do 100 units for that patient. I'm not going to give her the 200 units. So how long does it last? Again, it's on average of nine months. We don't see a loss of effect, for the most part, with repeat injections. And this is shown, um, and Mike Kennelly looked at the long term, so we're going out to as many as five injections, and patients are maintaining their response. The response isn't getting better, and it's not lasting longer. And interesting, when I talk to my wife about Botox in the bladder and on the, on the brow or somewhere on, on the face for cosmetic purposes, they actually tend to see a little bit of a longer duration of effect as you get atrophy of the muscle. But I haven't seen, you don't really, I haven't really noticed that uh, on our bladder patients. Now, there are other studies that would suggest that maybe this isn't as great long term and that patients drop out. And I think there are two ways to look at this. I mean, yeah, patients drop out over time. But even at seven years, 60% are still being treated. That's far superior to anything that we have with medications for the overactive bladder side. And you have to remember, some of these are patients where the disease process may progress and get worse over time. So there are reasons why there may be a loss of effect, not that the medication isn't working, but the, but the neurologic disease may progress as well. So how do we decide? So for neurogenic to true overactivity, the FDA-approved dose is 200 units. And that's who I use for someone who's already on it, CIC, able to CIC, wants maximal therapy. But if someone comes into me that's a volitional voider and has a low PVR and does not want to catheterize, that's usually our MS patients, maybe some Parkinson patients, so they have more of issues with incomplete emptying, uh, incomplete spinal cord injury that void, we may go with a, a lower dose, the 100 unit dose. So other, other questions, right? I'm just going to go right to all the answers. 44 women with refractory OAB is to undergo injection with 100 units of onobotulinum toxin A. She is very concerned about how the injection is done and the potential risks. You tell her you should do this in the ambulatory surgery center with a rigid scope. It should be done in the ambulatory surgery center with a rigid or flexible scope. She will likely not have to perform CIC since she's a woman. Women have a greater risk of post-injection UTI. And she'd require re-injection in approximately six months. If I was editing my own question, I wouldn't have loved this question. Mm -hmm. No comment. Too wordy. Mm -hmm. So I, I love these answers because I hope from this, this session, you are all comfortable doing your injections in the office. And you can use whatever scope you want, whatever the patients are comfortable with. And we'll talk about, we're going to talk about how this is done in the office. Um, we haven't seen significant differences in CIC. The correct answer really is, is, is the last one. It's probably going to require reinjection in about six months. Um, so if it got approved for overactive bladder, urgency free urgent continence, in January of 2013. And I want to go some, through some of the the two phase three trials that looked at this. So this was 20 injections, half cc apart. And, and this really is our standard template of injection. And we'll talk about template of injections. And you can see from both the American trial and the European trial, patients had significant improvements in incontinence, urgency, number of voids, and number of nighttime voids as well. Um, 
you know, Sandup alluded to, what do we care about? What are the parameters that are important? So for neurogenic bladder, I would say yeah, for people that are leaking, it's incontinence, and often the urodynamic parameters are important. In overactive bladder, most of us, overactive, the urodynamic parameters are not what we're looking for. It's are you happy? And are you happy is based on quality of life questionnaires, which clearly show these patients with purple and the red are doing much better than placebo. This is looking at quality of life questionnaires and they're clearly doing very well with the onobotulinum toxin A. What is the risk of catheterization? These studies had a very strict definition. Greater than 350, start CIC, PVR. PVR between 200 to 350, start CIC if the patients are symptomatic. I'm amazed sometimes that you can have some pretty high PVRs and patients come back and say, I'm doing well. But if someone is not doing well, the first thing you should think of is, is there a PVR there that could be impacting this? So I tell patients about a 5 to 6% risk of um, needing catheterization. It's important. I think part of the discussion is important for patients to realize is that if you need to catheterize, this is going to last six months. The need to catheterize will absolutely not last six months. It's often going to be a couple weeks to a, a month. And if you need to catheterize, often it's usually no more than once or twice a day. And you're avoiding on your own, just not completely, and you have to get yourself empty. So you understand what the potential need for catheterization actually is. Um, and we've shown that long term, with repeated injections, up to as many as six injections, patients, again, continue to have that same quality of life improvement seen with the initial injection. Um, now, there are, I want to go through a couple of studies that again suggest patients don't stay on the medication. There are two studies that are out there and they both have some potential issues. The study by Mo, he looked at 137 patients that 80, 60% stopped the therapy over time. The problem is, the problem with that from my perspective is 21 were primary failures. So you have to actually do well to then say, are you going to continue with the medication? And then another study, um, looked at 120 patients that 70% stopped therapy, and a lot of patients had issues with adverse events and the need for catheterization, and the problem was these patients were on 200 units. So again, not applicable to the 100 unit dose that we use for botulinum toxin for the overactive bladder patient. So what's the right and what's the wrong patient for considering botulinum toxin? I would say the optimal patient is someone who does have urge incontinence, they can have urodynamic to true of activity, but I don't really care. If, I'm not usually doing urodynamics on these patients. They're able to do CIC if necessary, although there are some patients that if it's a last-ditch effort and the option is maybe I'm going to have to put a suprapubic tube in because we can't get their bladder under control, I still may try it with the SO. If it doesn't work, I'll just leave an indwelling catheter in place. Can't do CIC, I'll leave an indwelling catheter in place. Who's the wrong? Patients that can't CIC, won't CIC, won't have a catheter. Um, if there's bowel issues, it's a reason it's considered neuromodulation instead. If you already have a high PVR at baseline and you don't want to catheterize, again, may not something you want to do. So how do I do it? Um, I do it with the flexible scope. Um, again, coming along this, this uh, uh, um, uh, paradigm, um, I only use flexible scopes in my office because all we have in our office are flexible scopes. If we had a rigid scope, I probably would use a rigid scope in the female patient. Um, here is, is that not working? My video's not working, it didn't upload. Ah, and I ran all of, is it there? Oh, oh, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, put, sure, put, it's, I can show you just a video. So this is, I love this video. This actually is in a Parkinson's patient. Um, she was, we probably made her wait too long and she was due for her meds. So you can see that I'm, I'm actually not doing this on a boat in the middle of a hurricane. She just was really shaky because she needed her meds. Um, but this is just an example of me using a, a flexible, uh, flexible scope with a flexible needle. Um, so an example of how we do Botox injections. Can, can I make a comment slide. on that, David? This is really beautiful. The, what I always tell our residents and fellows is it should look like a ground swell. Like you kind of see the ground moving up beneath you. It shouldn't be translucent like a hydrocele, but if you don't see anything, you may be a little too deep. So right. I think that that's an important, that was a beautiful illustration of it. The other thing as far as, um, you know, 
technically using a flexible scope is more challenging. You literally need three hands. You know, you need one to drive the scope, one yeah. to put the needle in, and somebody to it's inject It's a two-person job. It's a two-person job. Whereas if you do a rigid scope, you can hold the scope in your hand and just go, J -j 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 -j, but you have to have the right scope. So we can talk about equipment that would make it, that would facilitate it and make it easier for you. But again, if you have flexible scopes, obviously that's more comfortable for the patient. It's just that you need somebody to assist you to do the actual injection. Yeah. And and when we do that, we will, you know, I'll plant the needle and I'll say, okay, and she'll inject and she'll say, okay, so that I don't pull the needle out early and then waste Botox because it's like liquid gold, right? So right. I don't pull the needle yeah, out until your, she your says Your assistant okay. needs to know to wait until you say okay because you we get a new nurse in and they may, he or she may just start injecting and be like, whoa, 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 I'm not happy where I am yet. I mean, usually what I'll do with the needle is I'll kind of pop in and then pull back a little bit so I'm kind of right at that right area. You know, what I'll find with the flexible scope is when you're going laterally, you can almost hilt it and you're in the perfect spot. When you're going straight on with the flexible scope and that needle, you always have to pull it back a little bit. Um, so we're talking about scopes, needles, and injection paradigms. Um, I would say rigid is easier for women. It definitely has the cheaper needles. It's easier to stay on your template. Um, but also with the rigid scope, it's harder to go laterally. Mm -hmm. um, the flexible scope has the easier, has a more expensive needle, and, and when you first start, you may find it a little more challenging to stay on your, your injection template. There are, these are the primary needles that are used. Um, I use the Olympus needle. Um, I think it is by far and away the best. It has the most flexibility. It has the sharpest needle bevel, um, and when you put it in, you can, it's protected. You put it in, and then once you pop through, you can pop the needle out. One thing is when we first started doing this, I would go in with the needle unexposed, and then once I was done, I was happy and just pulled the needle out because it's just coming out, and I think I ruined a couple working channels doing that. you got to put it back in and take it out as well. And since I've been very careful about that, I don't think we've actually had an issue with the working channel. Have you seen that needle, though, all of you out there? This, this, when he says protected, can you go back one day? Yeah. When he says protected, that outer sheath, you can see there's two pieces. So can you there's no to? needle there. So there's just two pieces. There's the sheath, this part, the sheath, and, and then there's the, the needle. There's a needle that's inside. I don't, know, I don't think I have a picture of the needle separate. But this is when this has now not been pushed all the way through. So there's no needle out, and now we push the needle in through the, the protective sheath, and the needle is now out and ready to be used. So this is, in my mind, the best needle. It also is the most expensive needle. I work at a university. They have no clue that there are other needles that are cheaper because I've never used another <laughs> needle. And please don't tell the administrators at USC that I'm using the most expensive needle because I don't want to change. I like my needle. We use that too. Is that the one you use? Yeah, we've been using the Labrie, and, and yeah, it's not as good. Yeah. Um, the Cook needle, I think, is probably the maybe the maybe the cheapest of the needles. The challenge of the Cook needle is you have to back load it, because the only way you protect it is there is a protective sheath. So you before you put the scope in, you put the needle through with a protective sheath over the needle. You push the needle through to the end of the scope. Now you take the protective sheath in, and you can't. You can't move your needle back into the working channel, you know, just right to the edge, and you can put the scope in. Um, this was the this was interestingly the needle that Allergan asked people to originally use when they did the phase three trials, and they had a lot of inexperienced injectors who ruined their working channels because they didn't know how to use the yeah. needle. That's nine thousand dollars, by the way, to fix. Yes, it is. I just happen to know that number. <laughs> <laughs> And this is the Labyrinth needle. What's what's actually cool about the Labyrinth needle is you can change the depth of your injection. Do you ever change the depth of the injection while you're using it, stand up? How do you do that? Uh, yeah. I mean, how do you, how do you what, how do you strategize? Oh, I think it was based on how thick someone's bladder is. Maybe okay. a neurogenic patient, they tend to have a thicker bladder. Uh, a female. Who so you won't um, change it with at, during within one person's injection. Usually less often. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, my issue with the Labyrinth needle is that it, it's a little bit, it's harder to uh, deflect your scope. So if you really want to, if you're getting out wide with, a, with the flexible scope, you have a little bit less um, flexibility with that. Um, and this is the Williams needle, which is a disposable needle for a rigid scope. Uh, you, some of you may have just the rigid needle that came with the scope, whatever works. Um, that, that's fine. That's certainly very cheap. 
Um, so injection paradigm. So you know, there's what I mean, everyone has their own paradigm. I'll do 10 to 20 injections on a idiopathic overactive bladder patient. We're doing a half to one cc. If I'm doing an injection and someone's really uncomfortable in the office and I want to do as little injections as possible, I might do four or five injections and just load them up and get out. Because I don't really think it matters. And we talk about we want to see this subtle rise when you do the injection. But again, like I spoke to a lot of people that were going to be new injectors for the trial. And based on their questions, I'm thinking they may not have done optimal injections when they first got patients in the study. And they did an analysis, and the study site did not matter in terms of outcomes. So I'm not sure that it really matters that I'm being so dogmatic with my residents and fellows about just get in the right way and get this subtle rise that KK was talking about. If you get it in, it may be all you need. And then, you know, you, we, want, we don't want to blow. We don't want to want to see something going on. Again, does it matter? And then there's some even newer data that would suggest that maybe you can do it just with a couple 10 trigonal injections and maybe even with a lower CIC rate, this study called the LOBOT. So there's a variety of ways to do this. Um, and again, I do this 100% in the office, 100% in the office, 100% in, in the office. So this is easily doing the office. We'll give the patients, uh, depending upon where I am, 30 to 50 cc's of lidocaine in the bladder, let it sit there for 15 to 30 minutes. About the same. About minutes. the same. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was just going to make a comment on the trigonal thing. Does everybody know the story behind why we were trying to avoid the trigone in the first place? I do. <laughs> so there was concern about, about us precipitating vesicoureteral reflux, which turns out not to be a problem. So really, when we sit down and talk and debate about it, I, I do inject the trigone. I just do a couple of them because I think that's where the nerve-rich area of the bladder is, and perhaps we might get a little sensory benefit right. from it. I don't know. None of this has been, you know, this is sort of so, off-label talk, but things that we're all thinking about because there isn't really a standardized way to do. I mean, you know, the trigone, again, is where all the sensory, a lot of sensory activity is going in. Those neurotransmitters, again, more than just acetylcholine are impacting that. Two things about the trigone. It's, it's actually, I think, much harder to inject the trigone with a flexible scope, mm -hmm. depending yes. upon the patient mm -hmm. and the anatomy. And the trigone is the one place where when you inject, you may get a little more bleeding. Um, I didn't really address that. If I get bleeding during the injection, usually it's minimal, but if there's a little bit more than I want, I'll just stop and just lay the needle right on that site for 15, 20 seconds, and that's pretty much all you need. Very rarely does that. Um, and I don't actually stop anyone on their blood thinners. Do you stop blood thinners when you I do it? I don't anymore. I don't stop blood the thinners. The other thing, the, the reason why I was mentioning the trigone, by the way, is because sometimes you get <clears> in there, and if, especially if you're doing it with a flexible scope, and it is harder to inject the, because of the angle, it is harder yeah. to, to inject the trigone. But if you find yourself in there and all of a sudden you're a little disoriented and you think, oh, my God, did I just inject the trigone? Like, don't panic. It's fine. Yeah. It's probably good. I mean, or, you know, whatever. It's not going to be harmful. A lot of times you... You'll find yourself having done something, and you think, oh, my gosh, we're not supposed to do the trigone, and you just realize that it's yeah. okay. So I don't stop – and you, you, you don't stop anticoagulation, but – I, I do. You, you do? Yeah. Had, so do take that, that for what you want. And then last slide is just coding. For those of you that, that don't know, um, CPT code for botulinum toxin is 52287. There's a J code for the medication. So it's one of the things I had to look up because I'm at a university. We don't use J codes, but for those mm -hmm. of you that would – I was going to ask you guys one thing that what do you do with UTIs? So a number of our patients, be those on CIC, the small handful come in with an SP tube and you need to get a little bit better help because they're leaking out the urethra. Uh, colonized, not, if someone's a, an OAB, idiopathic patient, how are you handling that at the time of your injection? So, they drove in an hour and a half. So the so there's been a fair amount of data looked at. So there's a couple of things about UTIs that I'm going to answer your question. Add one more thing that I forgot to mention. That I unless someone is actively infective, infected, I'm injecting them, and and that's significant because I'm injecting a lot of neurogenic bladder patients, and every now and then we'll inject a patient that has an SP tube but still leaks per the urethra. We want to calm any kind of diffusor activity down. Um, I'm not checking the urine. I'm going to give them. We give them. We give them one antibiotic the day of the injection, and that's it. Um, but I will only not inject someone if they're actively infected. If there's someone who's had recurrent UTIs and I'm worried, I may give them a little bit of a pretreatment for several days. The other thing that's actually been very interesting, and and people have looked at this in patients with bacteria, 
And do they have a greater risk of UTI post-injection? And the answer to that is no. Do they have a greater risk of not having an adequate response to the uh, post-injection? The answer to that is no. There's also been some data that is actually fascinating to me that would suggest that, and this is, this is more in the neurogenic bladder population, that those patients with neurogenic bladder that have recurrent UTIs now have a decreased risk of UTI after injection of botulinum toxin. I think the idea is you've now decreased bladder storage pressures, you have a healthier bladder, bladder is able to now fight, um, fight infection better than it would when it was, quote unquote, less healthy. Um, do you guys do anything differently with your Botox injections in terms of infections? Infection. No, I was going to say same thing. Um, you know, that was the point of it. Is is that unless they're actively uh, symptomatically infected, mm -hmm. we'll almost always go ahead with an injection because so many of them come in with a dirty urine for a variety of reasons. But they're colonized or they have uh, catheters, SP tubes. Maybe they don't empty always as well. So there's a. Yeah, but I mean, we almost you, always do when that. You, when you look at the, the the all the phase three trials, patients got these three days of antibiotics. I'm like, I'm going to give someone more antibiotics and now we're supposed to give them for open surgical procedures? It's ridiculous, right? Um, so we, we've, right. I think we've all somewhat moved away you from know, that. You know, prior to the official approval of Botox, we were doing it on a botulinum toxin. We were doing it off-label, as many of us were, and I wasn't giving any antibiotics and started to do it once it became FDA approved because that's what the FDA mandates. Yeah. Basically, that's what the studies um, sh Suggested, so we're trying to stay in line with that. But they actually did quite fine. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, the only yeah. thing that came up was I think maybe as KK is getting her slides is that um, every so often I have a patient who she's like, well, can you do the injection? Don't do it like you did the last time, but the time before, do it just like that. I'm like, well, it's <laughs> that's not how it works. You, you do the same way. Have you noticed sort of inter-injection variability at times? Uh, Idiopathic. Well. Yes. I, I think for us sometimes the uh, inter-injection variability may be our fellow. <laughs> um, you know, we, we do it with fellows and, you know, and, you know sometimes, I mean, if, if, if the injection isn't going the way I want, I will definitely say, you know, let me just do some of these injections. But, you know, after two or three injections, usually our fellow is doing it as well as we are. It's not, this is not hard. Um, but every now and then you'll get a fellow where, you know, you'll get a patient where they don't do well. Um, and it's interesting, I'll go back to my wife, they had a run where patients were having like, having all this pain with their injection with their botulinum toxin in the office, and then they got a new batch and it was fine. So uh, maybe every now and then you get a, a batch that is not is a little bit different. I don't know. Um, but if someone is done well for a period of time and they have one bad outcome, I would definitely try it again just to make sure this is I want to it's a trend and not just a, a one off. Before right, you something I, else. I agree with that. I mean, it could be the lot, it could be the template, perhaps it could be the dilution. There are a lot of things that we haven't pinned down yet, and I think that's an area of, of uh, uh, focus for us to try to figure out the answer to that. But then it comes down to what if somebody gets, you know, if somebody's, it's easy, it's kind of a, an easier answer, an easier question to answer if they've had luck with it or you know been doing well for for years and all of a sudden didn't, versus the first time person. You know, if they don't do well the first time. I think it's reasonable to try again for these very reasons, but um, twice maybe then maybe that's not the reason that's not the right thing for them. Okay, how many of you do sacral neuromodulation again? How many of you have been doing it since before 2013? Okay, the reason why I ask that is because the technique has changed a little bit and it's made a tremendous difference in, in our hands. Um, I started doing it when I was a fellow, and I hate to say it, but it was in '98 when it first came out, when we were still doing the cut down. So things were, were very different then. And as time went on, the technique evolved, the lead evolved, there, there are tines, et cetera. Now there's other um, sort of um, c competitors, I guess, in the space now. And so um, th there's been a lot of evolution. And so I would say if you're not getting the responses that you would hope to get, and or if you tried doing neuromodulation prior to 2013 and you weren't feeling like it was that successful, it'd be worth a revisit because because the technique has become much simpler. We're going to go through that. Um, and you, you're always welcome to come visit any one of us, and we can show you, because it makes all the difference in the world. So with that, I'm going to ask a couple of questions again to get you guys thinking. Um, following successful placement of a sacral neuromodulation device for refractory urgency incontinence, a 59-year-old woman has pain over the IPG site, in, which is the battery site, in spite of turning the device off. Impedances are greater than 4,000, 2,700, 400, and 3,300 ohms in electrodes 0, 1, 2, and 3, respectively. The next step is keep the device off for a week and reassess. 
switch to use electrode number two, which is uh, the 400. Change the amplitude of the setting, surgical expiration of the IPG site, and revise the lead. Okay, yeah, so surgical expiration of the IPG is correct. If you turn the device off and it doesn't make any difference, I mean, so, like, if it's the stimulation, you turn off the, the stimulation, then you can think about doing reprogramming, et cetera. Um, if you turn the device off and it doesn't make any difference, you have to think about a common thing that could be infection of the device, so at least consideration. You can try antibiotics, I suppose, but if it's infected, 99 times out of 100, the device is going to have to come out. You can't really, I've tried to salvage a couple of them over the years, and invariably that doesn't work. So, okay, next one. Upon stimulation of a seeker needle during stage one placement for sacral neuromodulation, isolated bellows is noted. The next step is move up one foramen, move down one foramen, move the needle more medially, move the needle higher in the foramen, place the needle deeper. Huh, okay, well, I'm glad you're all here. <laughs> okay, it took me a second to think about this. Okay, so we're trying to aim for S3, which we're going to talk about, okay? And S3, you're going to get bellows and toe, greater toe plantar flexion, right? S4, you're going to get isolated bellows, so you want to move up one level. So I'm glad you're here. That's actually great. That gives us a purpose here. Um, if you're in S2, you're going to get some rotation, some foot, um, and some sort of contraction, maybe some hip flexion in addition to whatever else you might get, but that, that rotation. And lastly, before we get started, after experiencing relief of his refractory OEB symptoms for 18 months following sacral neuromodulation placement, a 65-year-old man has sudden return of his symptoms. The next step is urodynamics, add pharmacotherapy, ensure the device is on, reprogram the device, and check impedances. Great. Yeah, so check check and make sure the device is on that. Uh, we've seen time and time again, so actually what we do now is we advise our patients to check periodically. Because I'll tell you what we used to tell patients over the years, again, things have evolved a lot. We used to tell the patients, turn it up as high as you can tolerate without being uncomfortable so that you always build the stimulation. And now we do just the opposite. We confirm that, that, that it's in the right place, and we make sure they feel that sort of perineal, vaginal rectal, or penoscrotal rectal sensation. And then we tell them to turn it down one notch, so it's flying right under the radar, and they don't actually feel it. And that preserves the battery, and we find that it doesn't matter whether they feel it or not, as long as you first confirm they're in the right place, and they don't have to be feeling it constantly. So, <clears throat> so a lot of times patients will come in and just whatever we go through when we come out of Nordstrom or come out of the bank or whatever, sometimes I think it turns the device off for them and they don't realize. So that's the first thing we do. All these other things are things to consider if the device has been on. But let's go ahead and talk a little bit about neuromodulation, and I really want to give you some practical tips on it as well. Um, and then we'll close out with some case-based discussions with uh, Dr. Ginsburg. So general key considerations that we need to think about whenever we're doing anything for patients with OAB and thinking about third-line therapies is the safety, the efficacy, the cost, how easy is it for us to perform it, how easy is it for the patient to tolerate it, how long is it going to last, and any side effects that we might want to really coach our patients on. Specific to sacral neuromodulation, we're going to talk now about the indications and contraindications, a little bit about technique, a little brief thing about programming, which your you know, representative can help you with as well, um, some troubleshooting, 
and then maintenance we can talk about. So who would benefit? That's indications and contraindications. It's FDA approved for S3 stimulation for patients 16 and older, actually. So it's young. It's not 18. It's 16. For refractory urgency, frequency, with or without urgency incontinence. Um, unobstructed urinary retention, which of course we're not talking about here today, and fecal incontinence. Now, fecal incontinence and urgency incontinence together, we term dual incontinence, and in those patients, we will often go straight to neuromodulation, sacral neuromodulation, because those patients can benefit from from the neuromodulation for both issues, and so it's remarkable. Are you KK, are you saying yeah. you go straight before trying oral meds? Or you no, try no, no, no. I mean, straight, straight, I wouldn't do Botox or. Gotcha. You know, yeah. All right. Because they really benefit tremendously. And as it turns out, you don't have to be quite as precise on the fecal incontinence. Um, you can get, you don't have to be as precise as you have to be for, for bladder uh, urgency incontinence. But they, they are the happiest patients in the world. And if you start to ask your patients, it's remarkable how many patients actually suffer from fecal incontinence as well. I mean, I, you know, if only in the last probably six or seven years maybe have gotten in the habit of asking that as well. Um, and, and pelvic floor medicine's evolved to the point that we, we really treat the pelvic floor as a global entity. And you ask that question, and people are so relieved that you ask them that, actually. And it's it's amazing how many people have been living with that. So contraindications are MRI below the neck. Um, so you can get a head MR with an inner stem device in place. The concern is that the MR can heat the lead and cause damage to surrounding tissues. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of you know little case series that suggest that you can do it off-label. Um, and actually, uh, I'm also going to tell you a little bit about, well, I'll just tell you now, and we can slip over, skip over that slide, that, they, uh, that there's going to be a submission uh, in the fall for an uh, MRI-compatible, full-body MRI-compatible device. Um, with an anticipated about this time next year and anticipated approval. So that will change the whole playing field, I think, because there's a lot of patients such as, for instance, the MS patients who can't get an inner stem device who probably would benefit from it. Um, and I shouldn't say inner stem sacral neuromodulation because there are other now newcomers on the, on the field. Um, but uh, who have, um, MS patients who may benefit who can't get it right now because they need serial MRI. So that's going to change things. Uh, scuba diving below 30 feet. Uh, and I actually learned this the hard way because I had one patient's husband who was really mad. He's like, uh, <laughs> who's going to be my diving buddy? And the wife says, not me. <laughs> so she did really well with her neuromodulation. But, um, is, is, so that, is that really a, I did We both had, we had no idea that was the case. That's in the package insert? Uh, or whatever it's you know, with. I, yes, it's an official. That's fantastic. Did anyone else know that? Because I didn't know. Because I guess we have to ask. You, know, you could ask. You know, you ask the AUA symptom score, and then you have to ask right afterwards. Do you, do you scuba, scuba dive, dive right <laughs> below 30 feet? You can snorkel. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So how does it stack? I don't know. I don't. Now I'm going to have to go see if it's in the package insert. But I know that that's an issue. Yeah. So. Um, and I, it's very theoretical. I mean, it's just like us telling people that you have to turn the device off when you go through security at the airport. We, we've never had anybody have a problem with it. We just don't want it to scramble well, the program. Well, well, based on the MRI data you're going to show, yeah. maybe they can scuba dive. <laughs> That's true. Well, the other question is, can they, f you know, go fly, fly to Europe, whatever, and that hasn't been a problem. So, you know, I mean, again, some of this is theoretical, and it's the way it came through the FDA, and so we propagate that information. Um, but anyway, as long as you coach your patients on it. How does it stack up to other therapies? And Sandy and David have shown you a little bit of data, that comparative data. I'm going to pretty much summarize this for you. But so um, Steve Siegel did a nice study randomizing patients to sacral neuromodulation versus standard medical therapy about 70, 70 to 80 people in each arm. Bottom line is this. The success rate was much higher with the sacral neuromodulation group, but the, and the adverse effects were different adverse events, but they were not statistically significantly different. So patients will do better on sacral neuromodulation, but it's all in the investment, right? Investment meaning how much, I mean, it's more invasive. It's a bigger deal. You've got an operation, you know cost more money up front anyway. So, I mean, it's sort of in what you're, how, how much it bothers you. And really, when it really comes down to any of the stuff that we do for bladder control, the, the biggest indication to proceed with some intervention is how much it bothers the patient and interferes with their lifestyle. The Rosetta trial was a big deal a couple of years ago at the AUA in San Diego, and we were all anticipating the Rosetta trial. Bottom line was this was a randomized trial that Dr. Vasavada was a part of um, that was refractory overactive bladder treatment randomizing sacral neuromodulation to on a botulinum toxin. 
um, and they were just trying to see if it was um, if there it was sort of an, uh, if one was superior to the other. Uh, there were nine centers that were involved, and they've successfully and very rapidly. Um, randomized 381 patients. Suffice it to say, there was a little bit of an edge on the, the on a botulinum toxin group. Um, however, um, it, when push comes to shove, we, there wasn't. We we really weren't convinced that there was a huge clinical winner of one over the other. The other problem with the study was that Botox was injected at 200 units instead of 100, which is the standard for idiopathic overactive bladder. And the other thing is that they, we use the old lead. So again, getting back to that you know, 2012-13 time when the lead changed to a curved stylet, which we're going to talk about. And, and um, so the, when they use the straight stylet. The other thing is I think, you know, practice makes maybe not perfect, but practice makes things better. So these were not necessarily all equally trained or experienced implanters or injectors. And so some of these things kind of probably took the the edge off that little bit of edge that 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 uh, Botox might have had over sacral neuromodulation. And at the end of the day, we kind of all took away from that that they are both great options for the right patient uh, from this study. There was not a clear winner. So we will go on. Uh, I think I just talked to you about this. Okay, adverse events with sacral neuromodulation. Overall, pretty low because the serious side effects were were few. Although it was, you know, 16% of patients during the test described, you know, um, with three serious side effects, but most of them were, you know, unpleasant stimulation, that sort of thing. Um, there were three serious side effects in Karen Noblet's initial study, um, infections. Uh, and respiratory arrest in one patient, which obviously was probably not device specific. 30% um, after implant had an, uh, had some sort of side effect that was reported. Um, only one serious one, which was an implant site in, uh, erosion, so exposure of the actual device, which is serious, obviously. This is a, just a, if we concentrate on this side, basically an undesirable change in stimulation. 36 events in 32 patients, which was 12% of the entire group that she studied. 26 patients had implant site pain, and we'll talk about that, which was 7% of the entire 272. So in other words, like they were reported at different time points by these 20 patients 26 times. Nine had site infection. That's 3%. That's a pretty big deal, though, because that means the whole thing has to be explanted. So um, these are important and significant to think about. Other groups, the Siddiqui, uh, Dr. Siddiqui uh, had, uh, did a review of, this, of the literature, and again, 16% with an explantation of 6% of the explantations um, were for lack of efficacy. And then in this literature uh, review, 5 to 11% were due to infection. Again, not a little deal. What about durability? Looking back at Karen's um, no Noblet's uh, same 272 patients, at 12-month follow-up, she had 220 patients who had both baseline and 12-month diaries. They started with you know, three incontinence episodes, urgency incontinence episodes a day, and frequency of almost 13 in a day. At 12 months, 85% of them were, were successful based on the parameters that they had defined. But, you know, this is quite a, a difference from 13 down to 5 or 12.7 down to 5 times a day. So um, they did quite well. And it was durable at 12 months. Other pooled data, and I realize this is older, 2009, 2007, and I might um, venture to guess that this, if we looked at it now with the current techniques, we would have better results. Um, but back then, using the techniques we had then, you know, they looked at about half of the patients did well and to, out to three and five years. So I think that that might get better if we look at things five years from now after we've all been using the new techniques, which we're going to talk about. Anything else? So talking about what else, what other benefits you might get from sacral neuromodulation, there have been some studies that suggest improved sexual function. Again, there are reports in the literature. This is not an indication, but sort of a nice side effect if you get that when you treat someone for overactive bladder and they have enhanced sexual function. Um, again, quality of life related to fecal incontinence improvements. Uh, is huge. Um, and then they looked at the psychosocial benefits. Like, of course, patients who are incontinent, you might, I mean, you know, there have been studies that, that link incontinence to depression. Of course, you can't get out, you can't do things, you feel bad about it. Which one comes first is hard to know. Um, and one interesting study showed that optimism was not a predictor of success with this. But the bottom line is it can really help patients with their overall well-being. 
And then talking about MRI, there was one study, and actually um, Sandip's uh, colleague Howard Goldman reported an abstract form at, this, at SUFU this year. Um, the, the potential for considering, again, off-label, this is not this is off-label to use MRI right now for a full body, but there have been studies that show that that, that if you turn the device off, um, that, that it hasn't been a problem. Off-label, what we do in somebody who really needs an MRI, if you need a full body at Virginia Mason, we will consider explanting the device or we'll do the MRI with no sedation. So if the patient feels any discomfort or heating up or anything like that, they can stop the study. But it is off-label to do that. I think just one point, you know, um, so Howard Goldman was presenting this data at our SUFU meeting, and there was a discussion about, you know, depending upon where you are with the radiologist, some radiologists will balk at doing the MRI with the implant in place because they're worried about the potential issues, and you have to work with them if, if you do want to do an MRI. Um, I think it's now at the clinic, your, your radiologists are all on board with this? Yeah, they are, <clears throat> they are selectively, and... The only issue is, again, it, it was very specific to a specific MRI machine, model, location. We kind of joked about it, but the truth is also a certain longitude and latitude in Cleveland, Ohio, which don't ask me what it is. <laughs> but to that end, though, that was very specific parameters that they had, had dictated. Furthermore, I had a patient just recently, even you know, in our system at the clinic, that I wanted to do the MRI at a uh, satellite facility that they would still do the interpretation and they would not approve it. They would only do it at our main campus facility, 1.5 Tesla or less magnet, et cetera. And I think the submission is going to be 1.5 and 3 Tesla. But yeah. So they're going to submit. And so, uh, you know, who knows what's going to happen. But the nice thing is that that is finally, we kept hearing, it's, it'll come, it'll come, and now they're actually getting ready for submission. And I think that's all that we know and that's all we can say, but I think that's more optimistic than it'll be coming. <laughs> so cost effectiveness, uh, suffice it to say, you know, upfront sacral neuromodulation is more expensive than Botox, for instance, but at four years or so, if somebody's getting Botox every six months, it catches up. So that's, that's the cost analyses. This is the grid that I like to think about for patients, and now we're, and then after that, we'll go on to talking about some technical stuff on how to put it in. Sacral neuromodulation battery life is quoted to be five to seven years. They don't they don't, they're not at risk for retention. Again, as we mentioned, global effects on the pelvic floor. So if they've got fecal incontinence also, it's kind of a no-brainer to, to consider sacral neuromodulation over Botox. Um, the pros of Botox is nothing's implanted. You do it until in local, under local anesthesia in the office. They can dry themselves there. It's very nice. And it's kind of on a set predictable schedule of every six months or so. And, and patients overall do very well. The cons of sacral neuromodulation, you've got an implanted device that could potentially malfunction. The device the lead can fracture. Uh, they can get infected, which is a big deal. And it has to come out. Um, no MRIs for now. And it's not for neurogenic bladder, not because you can't do it for neurogenic bladder. It's for frequency, urgency, urgency, incontinence for, for the purposes of this discussion. Um, but, but a lot of patients with neurogenic bladder may need MRI. So that's, that's sort of the connection there. Uh, but specifically, the labeling is not for neurogenic bladder. The cons for Botox are going to be the risk of retention, risk of UTI, and the fact that you have to be doing it frequently, you know, every six months or so. So that's a pro and a con. So let's talk a little bit about technique and lead placement because I think that's been the biggest change over the years and has really made a huge difference. It used to be really you had to trudge through it and it was a little bit frustrating and now it's really quite streamlined and, and the, um, the company representatives will help you with it. So you don't have to bog down your office staff to learn how to reprogram. I mean, they can. But you can also ask them to help you, and that's sort of a service that, you know, we have all asked them to do so that we're not there, you know, tying up a room and tying up staff to reprogram and all of that uh, tech support. Um, again, superior medial in the S3 nerve. We're going to show you, I'm going to show you some x-rays and tell you how to localize that, okay? What you would like to do is achieve stimulation at less than 2 volts in, in all four electrodes. And when I first heard that, I thought, my gosh, that's impossible. You've got to be kidding me. I mean, I used to come out of the OR after you know, working for an hour and a half, um, and if I got two electrodes that were like seven or under, I'd be like, great, that's great. Like, we won't leave the OR now, except for in very rare instances, without all four electrodes being, you know, usually under one, to be honest with you, but we say under two, and they do very well. So aim for that, because it's absolutely doable, and, and I believe in that now. Um, 
So let's talk about how we do that. So the S3 nerve exits the foramen on the anterior surface just above the hillock, which I'm going to show you on an x-ray that, of course, is a beautiful x-ray. You don't always get those in the OR, but I'm going to tell you some little tricks on how you know where to, lead, to uh, aim for. The nerve travels medial to lateral, okay? So the lead should do that, too. And you'll see this little kick in the lead. It's going to look like a little hockey stick. It's not straight. And I'll show you um, unashamedly, or maybe unashamedly, show you some of my early ones so you can see how I progressed within the same patient and got better over time. Um, so the lead should follow this path, and the curved stylet helps with that. So patient in the prone position, here's an x-ray. A couple of these x-rays, I want to just up front give credit to Steve Siegel because he had the best x-rays and I've stolen them. And in fact, he's actually in some of my pictures. But <laughs> So here's your AP, okay? So where is the lateral edge? Right there. Okay, so what do you do? You get your patient on the table, you put a little Kelly clamp or something there, and I don't do both at the same time, because if you do them both at the same time, you don't know which is right and which one's left. So I do one, and then we take an x-ray, and we move that Kelly so you know exactly where it is, right? And then I do the other side just in case one side doesn't work very well, because then you go to the lateral, and I don't want to have to come back to the AP unless I really, really have to. I, I go AP, and then lateral, and that's it. So. That's easy, right? Everybody can see that. Okay, lateral. So the S2 joint is where, I mean, sorry, the S2 is where the SI joint is. So you can kind of see it there. Now, sometimes they have a double shadow here, and that's a little confusing. This is S2. You can also see a nice hillock here. The next to look down is obviously S3. So this is the hillock, this little bump. Where you want to be with your, your needle is going to be about a centimeter above the top of the hillock. That's kind of a general thing that I use. Um, and you want it to be parallel with the bone seam, okay? So the bone seam or perpendicular to the anterior sacrum. So those are two things that you can use when you're thinking about how you want to get your needle placed, right? All right. Um, the trajectory, again, is going to be here. It's going to be parallel to this, but it's going to be about a centimeter above. So we'll look for that. General steps. All right, so this is, again, his drawing. But here's the same picture. And here's that nerve, the, the, the top of the hillock, right? So what you want to do is, so when you move your needle, like if I stick it here and I lay it down, it's not going to be at the right proper angle, right? So then I would either want to move it down and stand it up, meaning like make it more perpendicular to the skin, or I could move it even further down and stand it up. And again, real time, if you were to come visit one of us, we could show you how we do it and kind of give you these tricks real time. But these are the things we're thinking about. So this is where you want to be, about a centimeter above. And so what we do is, in the lateral, we'll put a little Kelly clamp or a, or a, a debakey or something. And so you see here, this is our S3, OK? Here's our SI joint, so the next hillock down. Okay, so you want to be a centimeter above it. So this debakey is too high, and this debakey is too low, and this one's just right. So, so it's perfect. So that's what you're going to aim for, okay? And that's about the trajectory you're going to put your needle in, okay? So that, that you've got all these little things in here now that we didn't know 10 years ago. We didn't know to look for these things, and now it makes it so much easier. The other thing is I call it the eyes at the feet, okay? So Steve's got his head over the middle of the patient, but if you, you have your your nurse or your rep or whoever's helping you with the stimulation standing at the feet, they can tell you because, you know, you, what you want is your needle to be parallel to the central axis of the patient. You don't want your needle to be going medial to lateral, lateral to medial. You want it to be straight up and down. So you can see this one's medial to lateral, right? And the eyes at the feet can say you're going medial to lateral, move the hub away from you or, you know, towards you in this case. So I really use that a lot because their perspective in the room is going to be very different than yours, and, and you just have to trust, even if it looks like it's right. And, and the difference is going to be, you know, what kind of voltage you get if it's not in the right place. So this is too low, this is a little bit higher, it's going to follow the nerve a little bit better. And with practice, you will find that it's absolutely doable and reproducible. Once you get the needle in, if you get stimulation, you think, gosh, you know, it's like 2.2, 2.5, whatever, it's not that great, you can go higher and you can go more medial, 
Okay, and again, this one's a little bit medial to lateral, and you use the eyes at the feet. But the bottom line is, what you want to do is, and 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 it's just, oops, it's just like when we used to do filiforms and followers. Like you would, for those of you who are com um, familiar with that, we would leave the you leave the filiform in, right? And then you put the follow. You, you don't you don't uh, keep taking it out. You use it as a placeholder because that's information for you. So if you get into the if you get into the S3 foramen, but you want a little bit better placement, you use that as your placeholder, and you try to go a little more medial a little superior to that, right? Okay. Um, and then you want to launch in a very smooth motion. But in other words, well, so the other thing is that this, there's a little radio opaque marker here that you do not want to put in any further than halfway the thickness of the sacrum. So it shouldn't be any deeper than that. In fact, usually it's a little bit more superficial than that to get this lead to launch. And you see this downward curvature. And on the AP, you'll see that it's lateral. There's a medial to lateral uh, curve. Um, and you, this is about as deep as you want it. You, some people will straddle S2 and S3 right here on the anterior sacrum, um, but it just is a, a matter of when you stimulate to see what the, the proper depth is to get the best result. And there's your flare. I think in the interest of time, because we have some cases, I wanted to show you some, uh, let me just show you really quick, troubleshooting. And so we'll hit some of this. A 40-year-old female with OAB, she initially has a good response and she's having a declining response right now. First things you want to ask her, I mean, you want to make sure she doesn't have a UTI, you want to make sure she hasn't developed stress incontinence or something different, right? You, can't, you don't want to assume that all of a sudden your thing is failing. Um, you want to see if the, the sensation is in the right place, right? Are you feeling it in the right place? You turn it, you test it in the office and in, we call it interrogate, right? Which sounds awful, but interrogate it and see if she's feeling it in the right place. If she's feeling it running down her leg, it's, you you, you can try a different electrode. Maybe it migrated. I've had a couple gals slip on the ice and crack their electrode. You know, so things that, you know, if their impedances are elevated. So things that you want to troubleshoot and check before you assume that the thing isn't working anymore. Check on the battery life. Check and see if it's on, as we talked about. Impedances, we, uh, we'll talk about really quickly. Um, and I just went through this. But impedances, if you've got more than 4,000 ohms in all your electrodes, or let's say you have it in two out of the three electrodes, you can use, I mean, two out of the four electrodes, you can use the two that have normal impedances if they're feeling the sensation in the right place. Impedances just means that the, the circuit's open, right? The electrons aren't flowing through the circuit anymore. Something's impeding it. So either the, the connection isn't good or the lead has gotten cracked or something like that has occurred. Um, you can change the... Uh, programming. Bottom line is, you know, again, the, the team can help you with this, but Pulse width, I mean, if you've got a broad area of sensation and it's bothersome, you can contract the pulse width and make it a little bit shorter. There are certain standard settings that we put it at, but um, but you can make you can make it make the area of stimulation and sensation a little less. The frequency is sort of correlates with the intensity of the sensation that they feel. You can double up on things. That, um, you can double up on things. In other words, you could re-add medication, you might consider doing some of these things, adding things, but that's for uh, more advanced thinking, I think, if we just think about how to troubleshoot. Now this, that looks okay, it's not too bad, but if it's not working, it could be better, right? This is one of my own patients who, it could be a little more medial, it could curve out a little bit more, it could be a little bit higher, too. So we did revise her, and I'll put them side by side so you can see. It's just a little bit more medial, is this one? Yeah, a little down, more downward curvature. It's still, for her, turned out to be a little bit closer to the hillock than I usually like. And that's the other message, is that clinical response trumps what the x-ray looks like. Okay, so you got the perfect perfect uh, x-ray uh, picture, but if they're not clinically good, I'd rather take the clinical uh, um, response. Really quick, um, as far as pain over the IPG, because that's common also, if you turn the device off, and the pain is relieved, then it's something to do with the stimulation. So again, you can manipulate the amplitude or the frequency. You can go from bipolar to unipolar. I mean, unipolar to bipolar, sorry. Unipolar, uh, bipolar is from electrode to electrode going through the patient, right? As opposed to electrode to IPG, where the, the, sometimes the patients are more uncomfortable with that. If the pain persists, then consider an infection. It's not the stimulation, okay? And I think most of these things, you know, so this is sort of the old-fashioned way to do it, and this is a newer curved. The patient's response is much better. They get the stimulation at a much lower setting, so bellows at 7, bellows at 1.5. So you can kind of see that, that that placement, even just a millimeter, makes a difference. Um, 11.45. I think I will... 
these these cases were really just to illustrate for you, like these are th this is a real one that came to me. That's terrible, but we didn't know that. And I always say to my fellows and residents, do not criticize what we or anybody else did ten years ago because we've we've learned a lot more, right? So. We, you can't you can't use today's standards to criticize something that somebody did 10 years ago because we just have gotten better at it, frankly. So um, working well but annoying lower extremity sensation. Again, you can go you can go lower on your so again remember that S2 they get that rotation in the hip they get some lower extremity rotation if they're feeling a lower extremity irritation even if you're an S3 you might be picking up some S2 fibers so you can revise. Okay, now knowing some of the landmarks we look at, you can revise things and try to get things a little bit better for your patient. Again, don't judge early replacement by what we know today. This is my patient. I was I told I can told you I was going to confess right in front of everybody what my evolution has been. This I did her in 1999. You can see these we had these long leads. This is when we were still doing cut downs actually. Um, and then over time, she she was idiopathic retention. She was 19. She actually did very well and became a urology nurse. She's had four pregnancies since then, and every time we would do something to revise her leads, so you can see the sort of evolution. These were two little ghost leads that stayed in there, and we just got better at it. So, I mean, I say that so that we can, I think those are slides I was sticking in there to illustrate things to you, but yeah, so successful options exist. I mean, the bottom line is just know the tricks and, and know that it's possible to achieve this now with the things that we know now, and practice helps. I'm going to pass it back to David so we can do some cases, as we promised you. Uh, ten more minutes or so, right? Yep, thanks. And we're happy to answer any questions afterwards, or if you have any now, please raise them. I can't emphasize enough what KK was saying about programming. For those of you that don't do neuromodulation, sacral neuromodulation, do not be afraid because you're not appreciating how to do the programming. I am terrible at programming. I don't want to be good at programming, and that's what my Medtronic rep is going to be there for if I need help. They're going to be there the day you put the battery in. They're going to get the patient set up with four programs. The patient just needs to know how to toggle between the four programs, and if there's something amiss, we make a date for the, we usually do two or three patients at a time, and the Medtronic rep is there. Now, some of my nurses and PAs can help with programming. Don't be afraid of it because of the programming. Um, so, 54-year-old woman has urgency, frequency, and urgency incontinence. I'm going to go, um, despite oral therapy, the next step is A, urodynamics, B, MRI of the spine, C, botulinum toxin, D, PTNS, and E was SNS. And I put this one in for a reason. And I'll explain. Well, they were all in there for a reason, <laughs> I suppose. Um, but the reason I, I put this one in is because there's not really a right answer here. Um, there is one wrong answer, which is I would not get an MRI of the spine. If you said that you're not comfortable with the diagnosis and you want to get your dynamics because of a concern, no one would fault you, although she probably doesn't need it. Basically, she's pretty straightforward. And whatever you decide to do here, all options are open. And this is one of those ones where we talk to the patient I mean, and just say, what do you want to do? KK, anything to add for this one? No, I mean, I think it's all in the counseling for these patients, too. And that grid that we showed you with the boxes of pros and cons, I think talking to her about exactly the pros and cons exactly like that. I mean, you could even print that grid and give it to her um, or him or her, or her um, and discuss that, and the patient can help you make that decision. What, what, what I'll often do is if I see a patient is kind of moving along toward failing oral therapy, and I'm giving her the last therapy probably that we're going to do before we go on to the third tier, I often will bring it up that we are going to be looking at these possibly next time if you're not going to do well with this oral medication. And we have handouts. There are multiple places to get educational handouts on all three options. I said, read about these. See what, what interests you, what your questions are, and it helps for the discussion at the next visit. Um, so she had her exam was unremarkable, same patient, UA is negative. So UDS versus therapy, you're, you're, not, you're, doing, you're not doing your dynamics on these? Uh, you know, I do it sometimes for academic reasons, but really, at the end of the day, for certainly for medication, I don't. When I'm starting to think about doing something invasive, I want to make sure that I know as much information as possible. So I wouldn't do an inner stim personally without your dynamics. That is very debatable. Some people would say if So I'm, I'm going to be devil's advocate. What am I so doing? What, so what are why? you doing? Because we know yeah. that up to 50% of women with urgency mm -hmm. urinary incontinence 
won't have detrusive overactivity when you do the urodynamics on her that day in your urodynamic suite. She may have it, but you're just not going to see it on that study. Absolutely. So... Anything else you're looking for, or you're just going to be like, you're no, very I mean, good at being the academic urologist? Well, you know, <laughs> bladder capacity, you're looking for emptying, that sort of thing. If they're, you know, if they're already baseline having sort of a DHIC picture where they're not emptying completely, a Botox probably wouldn't be the thing to right. do. You okay. know, so there are things that so you may, can check may out. So it may impact your, your therapy. So, and, and I think for the, urge, for the urge frequency, maybe to me it's a little bit more important if you get more of the term we used to use is sensory urgency. It doesn't exist anymore with that patient that has an urge very prematurely but doesn't have the true of activity. I mean, there may be more of a neuromodulation. Um, so we're going to skip this because CNF actually covered it. This is the patient that is not responding to PTNS, and you're going to tell her to continue with that. Um, so 54-year-old woman is with her fractured OIB is injected with 100 units of onabotulinum toxin A. Post-injection, her symptoms are worse. The next step is A, start oxy, B, check a PVR, or a variety mm -hmm. of Reinjection options for botulinum toxin. What about check a UA? Oh, that's just not an option on this one. Oh, okay. <laughs> I would do Because then if that was the case, there would be two correct answers. <laughs> but you because, do want to make sure there's no because infection. Because you do want to... So you do... So the two things that when someone comes in and tells me she is worse or he is worse, there's two things I'm thinking of. You got a UTI, so KK says check a UA, or you're leaving urine behind. Yeah. You got to check a PVR. It's got to be one of the two, if they're worse. If they're not better, they just may not have responded, but I'm still going to check a PVR and a UA if someone's not better. And in fact, for my office, um, I see if I'm doing on the botulinum toxin, I see him back in two weeks. Now, if it's someone who's been doing this over and over, I'm not seeing them back in two weeks because you know their PBRs are fine. Same. Um, so we treat with 100 units. Symptoms are worse. What next? We're getting a UTI, looking for a UTI, looking for incomplete imping, checking a PVR. Um, oh, I need to go. Oh, shoot. Go back. Can I go back one? Uh, there we go. So how do you decide? So KK, mm -hmm. Mrs. Sh Miss, Mrs. Schwartz, super happy. Doing great. She loves, loves her botulinum toxin. When are you going to tell her to come back? How do you make that? How, how do you do that? Yeah, you know, some patients, if they've been having it over and over again, they establish a pattern. And they say, you know, every four months, my symptoms start to come back. So for, the, for those patients who you really know the pattern, we'll have them come back in four months. We've started recently to just make an appointment for people to come back in six months. And then, no, because we lose them otherwise. <laughs> it's like, I always say it's like making your dentist appointment or your hair appointment. If you don't make it on the way out, then it's going to be a year and they're going to be living with it for an extra four months that they didn't have to. And so you might say to me, well, do you inject them at six months even if they don't have symptoms? And the answer is, well, it depends on the patient. Like you could do that or you could say, okay, now at least we're talking, let's push it out a month. Let's push it out a month. Then, then you don't lose them. So, so that's kind of what I've been doing. So I do some of that and I have some patients who we know and they just... You just say, you call me when you know your symptoms are back, and then we get you in within, you know, another week or two. Um, on a idiopathic OAB patient, mm -hmm. are you going to ever go higher than 100 units? Uh, yeah, I do, and I do off-label in some patients. Most of those patients are the patients who I was, I was treating off-label prior to the approval, yeah. and so we've continued on that pattern for them. It's very anecdotal, but I think it might last a little bit longer. I don't. I haven't seen any more retention with them. But the studies, there are studies all over the place on that. Right, and then so then the issue is someone's not done well with but with their first dose of onobotulinum. Are you going to reinject them, mm -hmm. or are you maybe going to try something different? Um, maybe either either or. And as we talked about before, you know, sometimes we'll see people who've been doing very well for for years, and all of a sudden they get a batch, a batch or whatever, a, 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 an injection that just doesn't work as well, and then you reinject them and they're back on. So I think that if it doesn't work the first time, it is reasonable to do another injection. It might have just been your your injection, the lot, the distribution, the dilution, however, whatever it is. But if twice, then I wouldn't re-inject. Some people might say, hey, I went through it, didn't work, I'm going to try something else. So you just give them the choice. I don't think it's unreasonable. All right. Just one comment on urodynamics. If you've done urodynamics, patient does well, I don't repeat urodynamics. There's no reason to repeat urodynamics. If you do urodynamics, they didn't do well, you may go on to another treatment. Only time I will absolutely repeat urodynamics is if I've done a, a, a done an injection on someone with poor bladder compliance. 
Now, this is not FDA approved and indicated for poor bladder compliance, but actually it may help some patients with sub suboptimal compliance. The patient with poor compliance, those are the ones that are at risk for their upper tracts, damage their upper tracts. I want to make sure that I brought their bladder pressures down to appropriate storage ranges to whatever volumes that they're obtaining when they void or when they catheterize. So, Pittsburgh woman has urgency frequency at UUI despite trials and medication. She also has fecal incontinence. The next step is urodynamics, urodynamics with anal manometry, Motion item toxin, PTNS, SNS. Based on what you said, I'm not sure what you're going to go with here, KK. <laughs> I, I'm thinking one of two answers for you. We're not going to get so. So for me, I'm probably going to go right to sacral nerve stimulation. Because I don't think your dynamics are gonna, is going to change anything. Are okay. you going to do your dynamics? Because you'd like no. to do your dynamics on these folks no, sometimes. No. no, I would probably go straight there. Okay. But again, if you wanted to do this, it's not inappropriate. Um, and if anal you know, manometry, I'm not sure I'm not sure there's any indication now. I think the colorectal folks have moved away from that to a certain degree. Um, mm -hmm. But they're still doing it to, to a certain sum. Okay, so she has fecal incontinence. We talked about that. We talked about how we choose. 24-year-old um, man with T5 dysreflexia. So spinal cord injury with the dysreflexia, failed oral meds, UDS showed to true overactivity with sphincter dyssynergia. The next step is 100 units of Botox, 200 units of Botox, 300 units of Botox, tibial nerve stimulation, oh shoot, or <laughs> sacral nerve stimulation. So while you're voting, so if you ask me this, 15 years ago, it was 300 units of Botulinum right. toxin, but we've learned since then. Um, this is someone who we're going to do 200 okay. units. We're, we really don't do much sacral neuromodulation for uh, spinal cord injury. Um, and, uh, and this is someone that I, I would do in the office, but if you're going to do this, you have to be prepared to deal with potential dysreflexia when that happens. Mm -hmm. And if they have dysreflexia, I, I've had one patient where she really started going off and her pressures went high and I literally did 200 units of Botox and two inje like three injections. I'm just like, I'm getting it in and we're going to get your bladder empty. And she actually did fine with that. Yeah, so. that's scary. I think that's the main thing. The patient has to be an active participant if they're starting to feel that flushing, any, they, anything. They, yeah. they know. They know. They know what's happening. And they know uh, when you ask them if you do you have autonomic dysreflexia, they already they know if they do or not. You know, they know if they're at risk for it. By the way, sacral neuromodulation isn't completely out of the question. It's not contraindicated. It's just is it as successful? We would always go to Botox first, but the, we have done some. The the, the other th just one trick. If you ask patients if they have spinal cord injury, do you have dysreflexia? Some may say no. I always follow that up with when you're do you ever get headaches, get sweatings or chills, and they'll say, Oh yeah, all the time when my bladder's getting ready to kick off then you, my friend, had dysreflexia. You just don't know what it's called. Mm -hmm. So they may not know the terminology. So we have an MS patient. Um, she has failed oral meds. PVR is 25. Next step is, and, and, uh, and this one, again, is if you feel comfortable, we, we, this was a whole part of our debate yesterday in our complex pelvic cases, if you guys were there. Um, it's okay to do urodynamics in this patient. Mm -hmm. um, it's okay to do botulinum toxin in this patient. Um, there is data with tibial nerve stimulation with MS, and there's some now some movement to maybe doing sacral nerve stimulation because we're maybe thinking that MRIs aren't so bad. We used to think that we never put in an, an, an MS patient. So again, another one of those ones where there are potentially multiple answers. Um, so we talked about doing this. So with that new data from Cleveland Clinic, are you feeling more comfortable yet to put ner a sacral nerve stimulator in an MS patient? Um, so it's more our radiology team that's not comfortable with it. And so what, it depends on where they're going to need their MR. So some, some MS patients are followed with just have head MRs. Um, so for me, for me, yes, but I think it, the, the game is going to change once that approval. So if what if this patient has a PVR of 250? Yeah, so if she, that's what's her that's, manual that's dexterity? That's a very challenging patient. Yeah, manual dexterity is okay. I mean, then you coach her on the potential for, you know, needing to CIC. So if she Botox can CIC, it's easy, right, because yep. we're Botoxing her. If she can't, there are a couple things. You could do, yeah, you could do, I mean, some patients have really poor manual dexterity, and we will do, 
a combination of, of Botox and a suprapubic tube, for instance. And, and then the argument is, do you actually even need the Botox in that situation if you've got right. a suprapubic tube that's always to gravity drainage? But if they want to plug it and have a little bit more independence, you can do Botox, suprapubic tube plugged, and they can just open the hose whenever they want to. So I do have several patients yeah. I manage that way. That's and again, point. it's all in, in really spending that time with them and giving them the options and the pros and cons of each of them. So it's, I don't remember if I have any more questions. I'm going to stop here because it is 12, um, but we are happy to stay here. And if anyone has any questions, we're happy to answer any questions you all may have. And uh, great, yes. Please do your evaluations. Uh, I'm interested in the depth of the uh, Botox injection. I, uh, I've been doing Botox for a long time, and, and uh, I was under the impression that these are, you know, uh, especially if it's a neurogenic bladder, it's a thickened bladder. Right. And so you really want to go deep, I thought, and you don't want to see a bleb. And, uh, and then you have the issues of the trabeculations. Mm -hmm. Now, do you aim for the thickened part <laughs> of the trabeculation, or do you go in between the trabeculation? So... I, I, you're right. I don't want to see a bleb. I want to see this, you know, I call it a subtle rise. I think I you call it a ground swell. A ground I mean, swell. it's not like a bubble. You want to just, just see the earth start bit. to rise, right? But you want to get it into the muscle. You want, you don't want mm -hmm. it lying underneath the surface. We, we think so. Well, I, the other <laughs> is, there's all these questions. How much is impacted by the urethelium when we do this? And there's a lot of sensory activity Thank at the you. urethelium, Thank which you, impacts guys. this. Um, if you put it in the muscle, or the urethelium doesn't mean it doesn't go to the other part because there's a lot of diffusion. Um, and if you get a bleb, is that too shallow? And people have looked at this in studies and they haven't really found a significant impact on the depth of injection or, or where you do it in terms of the trabeculations. And, but I'm with you. I want to get that little small rise. But, you know, if my fellow or I have a day where we get a couple more blebs, I'm not losing sleep over it. I think patients are still going to do as well. In terms of the trabeculation, I'm actually looking more just for whatever. There's going to be a good landing spot where I can get that subtle rise. I don't think it matters. I stick um, it in the trabeculation. But it can, be, it can be much more challenging when you get a really trabeculated bladder to do what you think is, a, at least from, you know, a visually satisfying injection um, versus one that is actually successful. But, you know, I think we all have some of those same challenges with that. In the idiopathic patient, you know, the, the needle, the rigid needle that I use has a little mark at the four millimeter point. And what I do is I, I will, this is just telling you what I do and I, it's not, you know, the only way or right or wrong or anything, but we, we, you feel that little pop as it goes through the mucosa and then I back up just about a millimeter. So it's about three, between three and four, mil, three millimeters probably is about where I, where I, in the idiopathic bladder where it's kind of smoother and not as, not as highly trabeculated as a neurogenic, true neurogenic bladder. And, you know, we've, uh, whatever it is, just do it consistently. And if it feels like it's not working very well, then you make, make your little tweaks. <laughs> but if it's not consistent every time, then you don't even know what to adjust, right? Well, so. like, like what he was saying is that there are t times where I do the same thing every time the patient, and then there's this one instance she said it didn't work it this didn't work. time. You know, well, we don't know if that's the lot or we shook the bottle too much or I something don't have happened fellows, to it. So I can't blame anybody else. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So it's time for reinjection. On average, for idiopathic is six months, and yet in those initial trials, up to almost a little under a third of patients went up to 12 months. And oh, 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 three months. But you can't, oh. you can't do more than 300 units. Is it 300 now? 300 units three. per three months. What you're supposed to wait. I mean, the, the theory is if you have too much botulinum toxin on board, there can be some issues. But I usually wait three months, two to three months. I mean, you know, Dermatologists are doing this every two to three months. So I'm not going to go back and go back two weeks later and re-inject at that time. So I would wait three months. Just remind you, today you did uh, Botox. 300, it's 360, 360 units over right, 360, three months. I know it just, just went up. 360 units per three months systemically. Now, so if they're getting now, something for contracture or something. Now that being said... If you go see the physiatrist that take care of adults with cerebral palsy, they may inject 500, this is off-label, but 500 units in, in, in the leg. So they're going over that with one injection. So the other thing to think about is, you know, I have a patient who is also a spinal cord injury patient getting injected for their low extremity spasms by the spinal cord injury doctor, and I'm doing injections as well. We have to try to balance that out. 
But that being said, I, I know like, you know, my physiatrist gives 500 units of this guy's lower extremity, so am I really all that concerned if I give a little bit more? So uh, this is what is to taught to us and told to us, but and clearly there's a little bit of leeway there as well. But that's what the package insert says. So if we're going to protect ourselves, that we stay by that package insert. Thank you all for sticking all around right. here so long. Safe Thank travels you. home.